I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wingate University. And we're trying something new here on WTV. It's called Wingate Spotlight. And what we're doing is spotlighting various faculty members and folks in the community on sort of where they came from and how they got to Wingate and what they're doing uh, now that they're here. Uh, I'm joined today first by Mark Roncase, who's an Associate Professor of Religion here at Wingate. And uh, Mark, uh, how are you doing today? Good, good, good to be here. Okay, so you're our first uh, victim yeah, today, yeah, and yeah, we're going to yeah. learn a little bit about you and then how you, how you came to wing it in the second segment. So okay. tell me a little about yourself. Where did, uh, where did you grow up, and you know, what, uh, what was your childhood like? What was your youth like? Right, right. Big question. Uh, i from South Florida, West Palm Beach. Uh, grew up down there, uh, born and raised there. Um, that's West Palm Beach, not Palm Beach, uh, okay. on, the, on, the, on the other side of the, the intercoastal, so not, not the ritzy Palm Beach. I uh, grew up there, um, ended up going to Methodist College over in Fayetteville really to play baseball, uh, which looking back is, is kind of strange, uh, kind of ha how, how life paths end up sometimes. So uh, yeah, from West Palm to, um, to North Carolina. Uh, where I was there for, for three or four years and then back down to Florida, uh, Florida State for a, a master's in religion and then uh, to Atlanta and Emory University uh, for, for doctoral work. So uh, I've been, been in the South my whole life. Yeah, well, it's a little strange you'd leave South Florida to play baseball in North Carolina. That's kind of a mecca for baseball. Right, well, that's why, because I wasn't good enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, too many good players down there, so I, I had to come up here uh, to, to get a chance to play. And uh, uh, it worked out, and that's, that's where I you know, ended, up, ended up kind of pursuing religion. What was kind of your family life like? Were, were your parents academics? Were they interested in this? Or? Uh, yes, my um, my dad uh, coached and taught at the uh, school where I went uh, from from K through through twelfth grade. Uh, so yes, he's a he retired a few years ago. He's been a, a lifelong teacher and coach. My mom uh, has done a variety of things. Uh, she uh, uh, she's an English teacher originally. She's run some nonprofit organizations and 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 some other things. So yeah, I, I have a, come from a family of, of educators, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so you, you leave South Florida, you get to Methodist College. What do you, what do, you do it? So you play baseball. Are you an athlete or are you a student at this point? Yeah, and that's, that's a, a good question uh, because I, I clearly transitioned from I went there to play baseball and then a year or so in, I, uh, I, I knew I was never going to be a baseball player, but, but at some point kind of the light went on and, and I said I need to stop getting B's and B minuses and I can be a student and, and, and apply myself and, and do this right. And, and uh, so, right, I, I started as, a, as, a, as an athlete, um, uh, using the term loosely, and then, and then became a student. Yeah, is there anyone at Methodist that sort of turned you on to sort of things you do now, or even just kind of sort of put you into focus academically? Sure, uh, it was, you know, Richard Walsh, who's, who's still there um, at, at Methodist College, has now become a, a friend, as was, was certainly a mentor. Uh, it was uh, just one of those, Intro to religion classes that I took and uh, really enjoyed uh, the class and the approach to the Bible and religion, and uh, you know thing, things went from there. So uh, yeah, it was the Richard Walsh was the one who you know I had known the Bible. I grew up in a religious family, but then the, the academic intellectual uh, approach to it uh, uh, was was what kind of ignited the interest. And and uh, so yeah, I studied you know took every class he offered there for three or four years, and uh, uh, he really kind of. Uh, uh, got me going. And I presume Methodist is a Methodist school or no? Yes, yeah, it's, uh, you know, loosely. Loosely. Loosely, right. I, yeah, there, there's, there's not a, a strong uh, uh, religious connection, but yes. Yeah. Many people uh, at this, at, at Wingate, at this school, and many people live in Union County now are from other places. Um, they grew up somewhere and then move here. Um, what was it like to be an 18-year-old kid and you've lived in South Florida presumably your whole life and you pack up the station wagon or whatever it was yeah, or get it on an airplane and, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and go to Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yeah, what yeah. was that like? Uh, it, yeah, it was, uh, it was an experience. It was good for me. Um, I, I distinctly recall being you know, nervous and, and apprehensive, uh, which I try to remember uh, when I'm teaching these freshmen now that you know, I, I remember those, you know, what it was like to move away I, I, because it was the fairly traditional, um, you know, live at home and then pack up, just as you said, the station wagon, drive 700 miles to Fayetteville, and mom and dad drop you off in the dorm room, say goodbye, and you know, now you know, you're, you're doing your own laundry and 
you know, uh, taking care of yourself. And so, you know, I, I, I was lucky enough to, I think, be ready. But um, it, it was a big transition be, uh, from, from the environment in which I was coming, which looking back, you, you might say was somewhat sheltered, but, but, but in, in, a, in, I think, a, a, a good way. Yeah. And Fayetteville's sort of an interesting place. I mean, it's, a, as you know, a military right. town. Um, there, it's a place where everyone's from somewhere else except mm -hmm. that core community. What, did, did you enjoy your time there? What was that like living there? I did, but uh, I didn't have a car. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't really able to sort of, you know, I wasn't involved in the community, you yeah. might say. I was, I was a student and, 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 you know, between that and baseball uh, and not having a car, uh, which, which again was fine, kept things simple. But, um, yeah, I, I would go off campus to, and, you know, everyone assumed I was in the military because I still, <laughs> still have the same, you know, sort of buzz cut that I had. Um, but uh, yeah, it, you know, it's, it is a military town. It's not, not the kind of place that you kind of leave South Florida to go to. Sure. Yeah, so. Sure, especially West Palm Beach, I suppose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, you you graduate from Methodist. Do you immediately go to Tallahassee to Florida State? I do. I do. I've been in school my whole life. I have not not taken the two year you know trip to you know do, do some humanitarian <laughs> you didn't go work, yourself in right, the or kind yeah. of kind of travel around Europe or anything like that. Um, yeah, I, I've just I went straight through. Yes. Okay, so you get to. Mm -hmm. Uh, Florida State now, and your master's is in religion also? In re yeah, religious studies, concentration in, you know, Western religions or whatever they called okay. it. There. Is, there a, is there a reason Florida State was the place other than you applied and got accepted? or? I, have, I as I recall, it was a handful of places uh, that I was accepted. Um, coming from Methodist, not a, you know, not a, a big academically, you know, academic reputation, um, my, my choice were somewhat limited. Florida State has a very good uh, religious studies program, mm -hmm. and, and they did and still do, and uh, Richard Walsh, I mentioned, uh, you know, recommended Florida State. Uh, I believe at Indiana University, I was accepted there uh, and, and considered that, but uh, yeah, it was a good fit. Florida State was a, a good fit, and, you know, coincidentally being being back in Florida was, was perfectly sure. fine. Although a very different part of Florida than the different one you part, grew up that's in. That's true, that's true. Yeah, different different in, in several ways. <laughs> <laughs> did you end up becoming a Seminole fan? or? Did... Sure, I mean, while I was there, I'm, I'm not, not a, a, a diehard fan now, but yeah. um, sure, that was, that was, it was nice to, it was nice to go from the small 1,500 student sure. place like Wingate where, there at Methodist to, you know, the 30,000 student, you know, go, go to the games with, you know, 80,000 people on Saturday. Sure. And, yeah, what years fun. would you have been there? I was there in 96 and 90 or 95 through spring of 97. So those were heydays too. Yes, yes, those were uh, some good good football teams uh, before before the slow decline here in the, <laughs> in the last decade. Okay, so you uh, you have a BA from Methodist, you have an MA from Florida State, but you didn't stay at Florida State to get your doctorate. Right. What uh, any any reason or uh, I, I no, no other than uh, again I applied uh, to a variety of places and uh, was in a little better position had again some was fortunate enough to have some, some really good mentors who you know uh, you know had some connections you might say or that's not quite the right term but um, uh, I was able to get into Emory which um, the reputation the, the, the scholars sure. there it was it was a, a step up you might say and uh, so I was fortunate enough to have that uh, opportunities and and again I liked the geography uh, sure. there in the south uh, although Atlanta again a very different place from obviously Fayetteville and Tallahassee but um, yeah fortunate enough to get that opportunity. Okay and you uh, you get to Emory now are you in a sort of traditional religion program there or are you actually at the uh, is it, it Candler? No, I'm, I'm in, right. I'm not in Candler, which okay. is which is the seminary. Okay. Um, this is you know the graduate division of religion okay. is what I was in, and specifically the Hebrew Bible program. So there was there, the, the graduate division of religion. Yeah, was just you know was the graduate program, like you know as you'd have in history or anything else. And then there were you know the subdivisions of that, and I was in the the Hebrew Bible program specifically. Okay, Here, here's a question I have for everyone that sort of goes the route that you've went. Okay. At any point in your life, did you have to make the decision, I don't want to be a preacher? I mean, you know, you know so much about the Bible at this point. You, you know Hebrew and Greek and, you know, mm -hmm. did you ever make that decision for yourself or was that just never in, in that discussion? More of the latter. Okay. More of the latter. Uh, when I went to Methodist, I had no intention of studying religion. Okay. Uh, and so when I decided that it is what I wanted to study, it was with the express intent of, of becoming a teacher. So yeah, I, I never sort of wrestled with that, 
with yeah. that decision. So political scientists get well, why don't you go into politics? You know? Right. Because right. I'm not a millionaire, that's why I don't go into politics. Yeah, there but, you go. Right. But yeah. I assume you probably get that question sometimes. Why don't you just become a preacher? Or you just kinda get it, people just kinda get it confused, you yeah. know, or you know, they, they just kind of kinda blur the two together. Um, you know, which is understandable. But but, um, but uh, yeah, true, true. Were you pleased with your experiences at Emory? Certainly, yeah. It was um, a good, good group of um, students there. You know, when you're, as as you know, when you're in graduate school, it's it's your colleagues that you, sure. know, you you make lifelong friends. And in fact, you know, just getting an email this morning from one of the um, uh, women that I studied with there. And so yeah, you that that's really what's you know special about uh, good graduate experiences, those friendships and so forth. Okay. We have a few minutes left in this mm -hmm. segment, so I, I want to ask one or two more questions. Okay. Any nightmare experiences with the dissertation or getting done or any of those things that, you know, that happen, you, you, that moment of crisis that I think every grad student goes through? Did you have that? Yeah, well, uh, I don't know that I can put my finger on one specific one, uh, but, but certainly, uh, yeah, it's a big task. And um, I, was, uh, yeah, I was able to do it in really about a year and a half, uh, two years to the very completion. Uh, I defended the, defended the dissertation, in fact, just a couple of days before classes started here. Uh, so, <laughs> so I kind of finished in the spring, and then we set the defense date at the end of the summer, the beginning of the fall. Uh, so yeah, as I recall, I, I was driving back to defend, I think, on a, on a Monday, and classes started here. But yeah, I was fortunate enough to, to you know, be able to, to, to focus. I did, was teaching a couple of classes, uh, as is pretty typical, you know, at Emory, you know, one class. Uh, and my wife was uh, working and supporting us, so I, I could, could focus on the, uh, the dissertation. Yeah, well, that's an important key to the story that we've missed so far. That where where does the wife come right. in? And I met her, right, Michelle, uh, in, in Atlanta there, uh, and we were, we were married in 99, so we got married um, the summer after my two years of coursework, right before the exams, and then the dissertation. So, um, yes, that, that worked out nicely. Okay. So now you're getting close to being done. Uh, you're writing your dissertation. You're going to defend. Now you got to get a job. Now you have to get paid. What what was that experience like? Do you do you reflect on it? How many interviews did you get? Was this the only one? What what was that like before you got here? Right. Um, yeah. Sent out applications everywhere. Uh, we have a, a national uh, conference every year in, in November. And I had, I, I don't remember, I think six interviews there. It's pretty easy to, to set up interviews. Um, and uh, so I had a handful, maybe a few more there. And then, and then you get the callbacks to go to campus visits is traditionally how, how it works. And, and remarkably, I ended up with, well, three, three from the conference and then one more. So I ended up with four uh, campus visits, uh, which means you're down to the final two or three. Sure. And uh, uh, I went over four. Uh, typical of my baseball, my baseball career and my academic <laughs> career. Um, so, um, uh, and, and truthfully, in retrospect, uh, there are two schools in the Northeast, uh, and then uh, remarkably enough, and coincidentally enough, Mars Hill and Pfeiffer University, sure. uh, right, not far from here, brought me on campus. And, and for a variety of reasons, uh, the fit just wasn't, wasn't quite perfect. And so uh, the, 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 the Wingate opportunity was uh, a late developing one that the um, Scott Spencer, who I replaced, he ended up kind of announcing late in the spring that he was taking another job, and so a position opened up, and and fortunately here. So the way I read this is that you were a pretty hot commodity that Wingate was lucky to no, get. No, 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 <laughs> no. Certainly that's not the case. Although I remember Dr. Prevo saying he was surprised not at how many good applicants uh, he got in May or April or when 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 he was still. Uh, when they put the ad out. So, no, I, I, I was, was not, not a, a hot commodity. If, like I say, in fact, uh, um, I was only here on campus one day. And so I, I, I said to Rob, I said, yeah, any, the other ones were usually overnight visits, kind of a day and a half or really two days almost yeah. on campus. So any, the people who saw me two days didn't want me. The people here at Wingate uh, who were only, only saw me about four or five hours. I drove up and drove back. Uh, I, that was uh, not long enough to uh, <laughs> deter them. Good. Well, that's a good anecdote to end on. We'll stop here for the first segment of Winget Spotlight. I'm joined by Mark Roncase, Associate Professor of Religion. I'm Joseph Ellis. See you after the break. Cigarette smoking and smokeless tobacco use are bad habits that have a negative effect on your oral health. The tar and nicotine from tobacco not only stain your teeth and cause bad breath, but can also lead to other health problems like gingivitis, leukoplakia, or even oral cancer. 
Gingivitis is the early stage of gum disease, which causes your gums to be tender, swollen, or bleed easily when flossing. Leukoplakia is a whitish, thick patch on your gums, tongue, or on the inside of your cheek that may lead to cancer. Other signs of possible oral cancer include numbness or difficulty in chewing or speaking. Take an active role in your oral health and choose to quit smoking. Your smile and your health will thank you. For the ADA Dental Minute, I'm Dr. Maria Lopez-Howell. Thanks for coming back. I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wing University. I'm joined again by Mark Roncase, Associate Professor of Religion here at Wingate, and uh, we're having a kind of informal, formal discussion about, uh, about well, Wingate, I guess, at this point. So you, you're married now, you have a PhD. What, what year are we looking at at this point that in I your came. life? Yeah, that yeah you two, came. 2002, fall of 2002. 2002. You have just finished your dissertation, or your, your defense. Mm -hmm. You travel back here the next day or two days later and you start classes. What are the feelings? Did you have a lot of teaching training before you got here? Let's, let's start there. Yeah, well actually, I, I, uh, fortunately I did, which is, which is unusual uh, for graduate students sometimes. I don't know what your experience was, but um, yeah, I, we actually had a, a formal class, uh, a, a two-hour class on you know, teaching, pedagogy and teaching while at Emory. And, and as I mentioned, I, I had taught a couple of classes at Emory. So certainly not extensive experience, but I had a, an opportunity to give, give some thought to what it is to teach. Sure. Yeah, at my graduate school, they called teaching methods drinking methods, which I think you know places the value on the pedagogy at the, right. yeah, this, well, for this particular class. And but, I think uh, there's been a shift even since you know I'm, I've been, been here nine years. I think I think more programs are sort of giving some attention to the preparing students to teach, since that's what what they're sure, going to do. Sure. What was that? Do, do you have any reflections on your first day, maybe your first year at Wingate? You know, you're you're, you're filling the place out. They're feeling you out. Mm -hmm. uh, what was what was that like? I suppose normal sorts of, like you say, feeling things out, um, uh, you know, s student expectations, my expectations. I think looking back, I uh, probably made the typical uh, uh, rookie teacher mistake of, of probably expecting a little too much from, from uh, students. I, I still try to expect a lot. But uh, coming out of a graduate program, you kind of lose the, the bearing. You know, you've been so immersed for the last four years, and, and, and now you're, you're you know, trying to orient this material to, to people who've never encountered it before and who are you know, uh, 10 years younger. And so, uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I did okay, I think. But yeah, it was it's a matter of figuring out what, kind of how to, to connect with students and what to expect from them. It continues to be a challenge, but certainly early on. Okay. And in the religion department at this time, there's, Burns Coleman was obviously here, mm -hmm. Edwin Bagley was here, mm -hmm. Rob Prevo was here. Am I miss, uh, was Heather here yet? No, Heather was not here. Um, right, th those, those three. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we, we, the, uh, one or two people have come and gone since then. But yeah, uh, we, uh, Rob, Edwin, and Burns have been around a while, so they were here. And, and what is your particular place in the department compared to what they do and what your specialty is? Right, um, I do uh, the Old Testament. That was my, my degree was in that Bible. Burns and I do Bible. Uh, his his training and his he teaches the New Testament courses, upper level. Um, I teach the, uh, the the upper level Old Testament. Um, uh, Dr. Prevo is is a philosopher, and uh, Dr. Bagley also uh, philosophy. But you know both of them. There's, it's obviously not a big jump from philosophy uh, to religion. But uh, right, Burns and I are more of the the text Bible people and, and Rob uh, uh, Prevo and Edwin Bagley, uh, more of the philosophy, even theology, and then Heather McDivitt, who you mentioned, is, is the, the theologian. Theologian, okay. Right. Um, what, you know, when you teach a class, let's say any class, what, what are you trying to do in that class? I mean, what, what it's, I don't, know, I don't know if I want to call it a teaching philosophy, but what do you hope to do at the end of, say, teaching Old Testament or whatever it is that you may teach? Yeah, well, I mean, that is teaching philosophy, and that's, that's a, obviously a, you know, the question, what do you want to accomplish? And I, well, the, the short answer is exactly what I tell students on the first day of class, uh, in each class, and that is uh, I, I would like 
to use the material that we're going to deal with this, this semester, the Bible uh, in our case, use that material uh, to help students become better readers, better writers, better thinkers, more critical, more creative, more able to deal with uh, complexity and varieties of perspectives and points of view and uh, to think through different issues and questions and, and, and how to, to formulate different, different approaches and questions. So, so I, I try to keep that really f you know, front and center throughout the semester that I'm not, I'm not covering content, I'm not trying to, to cram knowledge about the Bible into them. Uh, because they're going to forget that, uh, you know, next week or next month, and, uh, uh, if not sooner. Um, so to, to take the opportunity, the, the 42 class room hours that we have with them, to it's hard to measure. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's hard, hard to, to say, okay, I did it or I didn't or I did it, you know, this well or that, that well. Uh, but but to, to use the material to just make them as, as strange as, and, and as, you know, too grandiose as it may sound, just to make them better people. Uh, who, who, as I say, are, are, are better able to, to think and to, to, to reason and, and engage others uh, on, on important issues. Yeah, I, the, the thing that, that's curious to me about people that teach religion, um, you know, at a, at a university setting is, right, there's a fine line between teaching the Bible and sort of proselytizing with, with the Bible, I suppose. Are, is that difficult to deal with? Do, are students sometimes confused about your place in the classroom, in, in a, you know, especially at a sort of religiously, at least historically religiously, university like this. Right, um, and students are coming uh, from from different different places and have different expectations, so it's difficult to answer that, you know, you know, on a, in broad terms. Um, but I, I, the short answer, right? I think some some students certainly do uh, expect this to be. Uh, a Sunday school class uh, or something, maybe like a, 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 even like a Bible class they had in high school, if perhaps that's the context from which they're coming. Uh, but I think they get pretty quickly that that's not what this is. Sometimes I, I debate, in fact, whether to say that on the first day mm -hmm. because I don't want to be confrontational or combative and say, right. you know, this is, you know, because academics. Because in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with Sunday exactly, school class. Exactly, yeah. precisely, precisely. So, and, and then which is, so, so you're, you're, you're ahead of me here, which is exactly, you know, how I try to frame it early in the semester that, you know, there are different ways to approach and so maybe this is what you're more comfortable with. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, here's how we're going to approach it, approach it in this setting. But sometimes, you know, and, and because a lot of students, uh, uh, don't come with that expectation. They really have no idea what to expect. They've they've mm -hmm. never, you know, they've not been in church, and you know, they this is n now with the new title now. It's you know, global perspectives in scripture. Before it was religion, R E L, yeah. and so now, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, I mean, maybe it even helps in so far as students aren't expecting this is going to be a, a class in which the teacher is going to proselytize or try to convert me to Christianity, uh, because you know, it, it's it's one of the six global perspectives classes. It's not a religion class, you know, so maybe the, sure. the class is, the rhetoric is a little different. And among the, you know, among the faculty, even the students, this is a pretty religiously pluralist it is. campus. It uh, is. Do you find that to be helpful in, in what you do? I, I do. I mean, I think, you know, our own department, which you mentioned earlier, is quite, uh, quite diverse uh, yeah. along those lines, which is great, uh, of course, I think. Um, and, and so, uh, sure, I think there, there's sort of a spot for, for everybody, you might say. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a big umbrella. Well, let's turn now to your to your research interest and and tell me about some things you've kind of done in the past and maybe what you're looking towards in the future about your own research. Uh, well, uh, you know, you asked about the teaching. Uh, the first uh, uh, project was um, really oriented toward teaching, um, and so I'm looking for ideas on how to teach effectively, how, how to present material to get students to do, as I say, to be better better readers and writers and thinkers and so forth. And and I, I'm saying to myself, there's got to be a lot of good ideas out there, but, you know, I, I don't, I don't, where are they? And so, so the first, yeah, the first really two projects um, that, that I worked on, which, which ended in books that I and Patrick Gray at Rhodes College uh, co-edited, uh, dealt with teaching. Uh, the first one, practical strategy, or teaching the Bible, practical strategies for classroom instruction, um, is a, a collection of 273, I think it is, uh, short uh, uh, ideas uh, on, on how to teach different texts. Mm -hmm. And so I was really just essentially, you know, as I say, as a book, but it was uh, getting in touch with 
uh, experts around the country saying, and any, even, even the world saying, you know, we'll, we'll give, can you give us some of your best teaching ideas, things that have worked really well for you mm -hmm. over the years, and, and we'll, we'll put them together in this collection and let everyone take a look at them. And it, it's, it's, um, it, it was well received and um, been very helpful to me, and I still get emails from time to time from, from people saying, you know, uh, you know, thanks for, you know, I really, I use your book all the time, and I, of course, say it's not my book. <laughs> I just, I just put it, you know, sure. was the one who, uh, put it together. So, uh, yeah, so the, that was the first project. And then the second one, um, uh, similar sort of teaching ideas. Yeah. Now I'm interested in that book. It's about sort of popular culture in, in teaching the Bible. Um, and, and you wrote a chapter, I believe, about music and how you can use popular music in teaching the Bible. Is that right? Am That's right correct, yes. That? Yeah, so as a result of the first project, we noticed that uh, there was a number of people who were giving us ideas dealing with, with art or literature or film mm -hmm. or music. And so we said, all right, well, let's kind of expand this into to volume two. Uh, and so that became Teaching the Bible Through Popular Culture and the Arts. And, uh, you know, a anybody who knows me uh, knows that, you know, I, I am not, you know, Mr. Pop Culture. I, I, I you know, back to how I grew up, I did not, you know, I grew up sort of uh, in, in, in a context in which almost culture was, you know, culture against Christianity. Mm. And so I, I, I certainly don't, you know, am no expert on sort of matters cultural. Uh, <laughs> that would be you. Uh, you know, we would be, have no comparison in terms of knowledge of culture. But, but I, so I just sort of systematically said, okay, if I'd like to draw in, uh, in this case, music mm -hmm. um, into the classroom, because that's a lot easier to do than film. Because you know, you know, you've got to find the clips, or you can't take the time to show the whole film or literature. You know, it's harder to ask students to read the Bible and a, yeah. you know, 15-page short story or something. So you know, a nice three-minute song, and, nice. and then you can draw that into the discussion. And again, using that as a, as a way to help students to think. So right, I just sort of systematically went looking for s songs that I could use in in, in teaching, and, and collect them and. And so the chapter there has essentially, you know, a couple of paragraphs uh, about how you might use this or that song, and uh, many of them uh, I, I use, many of them I don't, um, or have used them just once, or you know. So, um, and then the other chapters are written by people who know a lot more about art <laughs> and and film and and literature and so forth. Yeah, I, but you know, the the culture is so influenced by Judeo Christianity. I mean, even. Even an, an artist, a musician who's not avowedly religious, you know, it, it filters in. I mean, there's a famous Grateful Dead song, Samson and Delilah. Right, right. And um, I, I don't know if that's in your uh, book. But. I, th I, I, it, I think it is. I think it is. Right. The, you, there, are, there are, kind of broadly speaking, there are maybe two kinds of uh, songs. Ones that deal explicitly with the Bible, mm -hmm. such as you mentioned, the Grateful Dead song, or other songs. Um, uh, you know, just the one that comes to the top of the brain, because I mentioned it the other day, was, uh, you know, something like Kansas is Dust in the Wind, sure. which doesn't mention the Bible specifically, right. but certainly it's a song, team, you know, uh, you know re dust re dust replete with philosophy, mm -hmm. and so it's easy to discuss that in the context of something like the book of Ecclesiastes. So, uh, you know, kind of those that are explicitly biblical and those that aren't, but that can easily be connected to a biblical text. Sure. We have just a little bit of time left. Tell me about the future. What's the next project? What, what do you hope to do in the next couple of months or years? Uh, well, the global perspectives and scriptures, the, the, the new course that we've been developing. And so uh, really uh, trying to do the same sort of thing, a collection of, of short essays, uh, this time from people around the globe uh, who will give us their interpretation of, of uh, uh, specific biblical passages from their uh, cultural and social and religious location. And um, I and one of our uh, colleagues here, Joe Weaver, will uh, collect them and edit them. And forget, we have groups of four. So we'll have kind of four, four short essays on a specific text. You, know, you mentioned something like Samson and, or David or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then try to frame some questions, try to, try to take the four perspectives and, and frame a handful of questions for students to engage those four perspectives critically. Great. Mark, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for uh, you've me. been watching Wingate Spotlight. Uh, I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science, and we've been joined today by Mark Roncase, Associate Professor of Religion. Join us next week when we'll have Associate Professor of History, Carrie Heffley. See, see you next time. <laughs>